Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the 1946 movie It's a Wonderful Life and the main character of that movie, George Bailey, who of course was played by Jimmy Stewart. So this is my favorite Christmas movie. It has meaning on a few different levels and it resonates with a lot of different people. For many, it has become a tradition to watch this movie every year at Christmas time. I'll briefly go through the plot of the movie and then provide my analysis. So the plot of It's a Wonderful Life is actually fairly straightforward. We see a banker named George Bailey who lives in the town of Bedford Falls. He's distraught because his uncle Billy, who works with him, lost a deposit to the bank. And now George is facing prosecution and incarceration. George wishes that he had never been born and an angel intercedes and shows George what his life would have been like if he had not been born. After seeing this alternative life, he changes his mind. George becomes okay with going to jail, and he develops a new respect and appreciation for the life that he has. So moving to my analysis of the movie, I know that some people are critical of It's a Wonderful Life. They say that George Bailey's life really didn't help the people of Bedford Falls. The town of Pottersville was actually better. This is what we hear people saying. So, of course, Mr. Potter was the bad guy in the movie. And without George Bailey, he kind of takes over the town and the name is changed to Pottersville. So really, the critics paint kind of a story where George Bailey is really a failure. So ultimately, this movie kind of becomes a depressing tale. Well, I can see many of these points, but I actually like the movie. I think it works, again, at many levels. I'll point out what I like and I'll discuss some of the criticisms that have been put forth about the film. What we see here in the story of George Bailey is a man who always tried to do the right thing. He had dreams and aspirations that would take him beyond Bedford Falls if he had his way, but ultimately he chose to fulfill what he believed were his responsibilities, namely taking care of the family business, Bailey Brothers Building and Loan. This business is really the only alternative to people going to Mr. Potter. Again, he's the bad guy of the movie. So we see that George had a chance to get free when his brother Harry returned from college, Harry was ready to take over the family business so that George could pursue his dreams. But George could see that there was a better path available for Harry. So once again, George sacrifices for others. He believed he was protecting the citizens of Bedford Falls, again, offering them an alternative to George's competitor, the destructive and narcissistic Mr. Potter. At the same time, we see that George struggled. His frustration peaks when he's facing jail he was unable to pursue his dreams, and on top of that, he was going to lose his freedom. He contemplates ending his own life, which in one way gets expressed by him saying that he wishes he never existed in the first place. So this is an important note here. We see two different things, not wanting to continue to exist versus not wanting to have ever existed at all. So the movie kind of looks at the latter, but was confronted by the former as the crisis. So kind of an interesting twist there. So we see that George Bailey's death would have been tragic and hurtful. But again, that's not what's explored in the film. Here we see the consequences of his non-existence. In looking at the alternative reality, George really sees all the people he helped, right? He sees how he helped Harry, his brother, because George saved his life when they were kids. And of course, we see that Harry saved a number of troops in World War II because he was a naval pilot that shot down a kamikaze aircraft that was going to crash into a transport. So Harry's life is preserved because of George and all those troops. We see Mr. Gower, the pharmacist, who recklessly dispenses poison to a customer, but who was stopped by George Bailey. And we also see the town in general. So George had an impact on a lot of people. He realizes that his life was not without worth, that he was not a failure. He finds meaning in his own life. He's now glad that he was born, and of course he wants to continue living. I like this movie because it's actually quite different than a lot of other movies. It's not a tale of redemption. It's not like George was a bad guy and he realizes that he's a bad guy and then he becomes a good guy, right? That's a very familiar plot we see over and over in all kinds of movies. But rather this is a tale of discovering what's already there. It's about insight and awareness. It has a different take even in this dimension, again looking at non-existence as opposed to the end of one's life. In this film, George develops a new philosophy. He is able to make sense of his contribution to the community and beyond. 
He doesn't have to live a certain way moving forward in order to find value. He's already found it based on the life he's lived. It's also a classic struggle comparing good and evil, or from a counseling perspective, useful and less than useful. We have the protagonist, George, who's humble, kind, compassionate, generous, and caring, for the most part, battling a narcissistic and greedy criminal, Mr. Potter, who exploits the residents of Bedford Falls. Then, ultimately, we see a community that recognizes this disparity and comes to the aid of George Bailey and, in a sense, preserves his bank that had helped them so much. In the end, George's realization and change in behavior even helps the angel Clarence to earn his wings. So now looking at some of the criticisms, I've seen a number of criticisms over the years about this movie, and I think some of them make some bit of sense. Other ones, I think, can be disposed of relatively quickly. Let's take a look at them. The first one is that George has conditional worth, right? So George changes his mind because he did perform valuable acts. And what would happen if he had not performed valuable acts? And this is a good point, right? The fair question would be, if George looked back at his life and saw that he didn't do anything to help anybody, or worse, the town was better off without him, then that would really kind of throw off the story, right? And I think there is a good point here about conditional worth. George was valuable because he was a human being, and the movie makes him look valuable because he did good things. So it's a fair criticism, but I thought that the movie still worked. It doesn't invalidate the narrative. It just brings up a good point that we should keep in mind when looking at human worth. Another criticism I hear is the simplistic causality criticism. And the best example, of course, is George Bailey's brother, Harry. George, again, saved his life when they were kids, and Harry went on to save many people's lives. Well, if Harry had not been the pilot of the American fighter aircraft that shot down the kamikaze, somebody else would have been, and that other pilot could have shot down the enemy aircraft just the same. I think this is a valid point, but Maybe what they're getting at here in the movie is that Harry made a heroic contribution that perhaps another pilot would not have been able to make under the same circumstances. So he did something that perhaps few pilots could have done. Whenever a movie explores alternate timelines, I think this is always going to be a challenge. The next criticism is around how the community came together and gave George $8,000 to make up for the $8,000 that Uncle Billy lost. Because of this, we see the arrest warrant is torn up, and that's not how arrest warrants work. So George would have been arrested either way, and he would have been still going to jail, right? Whether the money came from those residents or not. That's the criticism. I think this is a valid point, but not every single law that is violated results in a prosecution. And things are much different in 1946. I don't think it's unreasonable to guess that the district attorney could have decided to pass on this case. However, I do agree that the arrest warrant would not have been torn up. George still would have been arrested, but perhaps the case would have been disposed in a different way after that. I think another valid criticism that I don't really see too much is how that arrest warrant get issued so quickly. It's probably just a device used for the film, but that was really quick, going from really no investigation to arrest warrant. Next criticism we have here is of Uncle Billy himself. He was incredibly irresponsible to lose that $8,000. That would be equivalent to about $130,000 these days. So if you're carrying around that kind of money, you're going to be very careful with it. Using this logic, one could argue that George Bailey was irresponsible for not properly supervising his uncle, which I guess is the point of George's potential arrest that we see in the film. So now moving on to George Bailey's personality. How would he rank on the five-factor model? Well, for openness to experience, I would say he's high. He was intellectually curious. He wanted to explore the world. For conscientiousness above average, he was a hard worker and responsible but he did improperly supervise his uncle, and he also had a bit of impulsivity. Extroversion, I would say above average. He was outgoing and assertive, so it seems like he was fairly extroverted. Agreeableness, I would say mid-range. He was willing to disagree with people when necessary, but of course he was altruistic, and in some cases trusting. And with neuroticism, I would say low, but of course at the end, he's displaying a lot of depression and anger. However, I don't think this was a tendency. I think it was a state and not a trait. It was something he was doing in that moment that didn't reflect his overall personality. At the end here, we see George went from wanting to end his own life to being as happy as can be. That's a bit of a stretch, but I think it was necessary to make this story work. So that's George's personality. Moving on to my one last point here, this is about the success of the movie itself. 
This movie was released on December 20th, 1946, and it didn't do particularly well at the box office. Many critics thought the movie was too sentimental, although many people did like Jimmy Stewart's performance. About 25 years later, in the 70s, we see the film makes a comeback by playing on television. Many people start to recognize that it's a great film, and specifically an inspiring Christmas movie that many people again watch every year. So I guess this just speaks to the idea that some gems are hidden in plain sight. All that time, few people recognize the contribution of this film. Sometimes people are talked out of liking things that they actually like. There's this fear about not going along with the crowd, a concern that maybe you're missing something that other people can see. But it could be that you're seeing something that other people are missing. So those are my thoughts on It's a Wonderful Life. If you have any opinions on this film, please put them in the comment section. Those comments always generate a really interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my description of this movie to be interesting. Thanks for watching.